Christ. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thank you. Thanks, Peter Conway. Palm Sunday is the Sunday of the year that is the most bipolar and schizophrenic, for we have two very different sort of senses of what's happening. We have the triumphal en en uh, entry into Jerusalem as the, the son of David rides a donkey into the city of David, and this is how King David marked his son Solomon as his heir, that, that Solomon rode into Jerusalem riding a donkey it was how he was proclaimed king. So this is this is exciting there's a lot of people waving palms they, they understand that this is a big deal that Jesus is entering and, and you add to that all the energy of, of the Passover everyone is singing uh, what, they're called the Psalms of Ascent there's a chunk of the psalm book that uh, are, are, are the Psalms that you sing as you're ascending to uh, Jerusalem for the Passover and it's kind of like the way that the second people start singing Christmas carols you're sort of now you're on your way to Christmas and people start perking up and so you combine the two and everyone's waving palms and they're putting the cloaks in front of Jesus so that the donkey walk doesn't walk on the ground and this is an exciting moment and then if you focus in on Jesus and his disciples Jesus has told his disciples three times, according to the Gospel of Mark, that he is heading towards a trial, a judgment, and the death penalty. Like, he is headed towards that. And so he knows that it is going to be ugly. Like, and so there's this, com this combination, if you had to have like two symbols for uh, Palm Sunday, it would be like party favors and the electric chair. Right? Like, because the electric chair is the modern version of, of the cross. Like, the cross was what they used to, uh, to, for the death penalty back then. In the modern example, that would be the electric chair. To the point that... It was centuries before Christians would wear a cross because that, that was, it would be like someone walking in today with a, a cast silver electric chair, highly polished with maybe some rhinestones on it. Like the, you didn't wear a cross because it was such a scary thing. And, and so that, that's what's happening in Palm Sunday. We have the celebration and Jesus is heading towards that trial. And so, which one do you focus on on, a, on the Sunday of, of Palm Sunday? Well, it depends on the year, it depends on the season, it depends upon what, what are you looking at, where are you headed right now? And, and what we're doing as a church is we're finishing up this uh, sermon series on uncomfortable truths. What are the truths that we don't particularly want to talk about, but are important to say, for Jesus tells us, the truth will set you free. If you know the truth, the truth will set you free. There is something very true of, that we need to talk about when it comes to the death penalty so that we can be, be free to more fully follow Jesus. But that, that's, that's where we're going to focus today. And, and let me, before we jump into this, uh, first say thank you. Uh, this has been a run of sermons, divorce, health care and poverty, abuse, race. Uh, these are part of the realities of the times in which we live. And, and I appreciate that you have stuck with me as we've done this. Um, I'm, and by no means do I claim to have said the definitive word. If there's more that I need to hear or understand, tell me. Like, I, I still have much to learn about all of these topics. And, and I promise that after Easter, it's going to be far more low-key. I think we might go to the gospel, the, the letters of John. Everyone's love on each other. That's <laughs> low-key. So, we're going to look at the death penalty today, because that's what Jesus is heading towards. He knows he's heading towards it. But before we get to it, we need to back up and go back into the Old Testament, because the death penalty is in the Old Testament. The death penalty is prescribed for murder, for adultery, for idolatry, for breaking the Sabbath, and for taking the name of the Lord in vain, which is a comment upon trying to tell God what to do. Taking the name of the Lord in vain is about using God's name to try to claim power over God, so that, that's, a, that's a different sermon, but uh, that all kind of makes sense. 
And there's one charge that is surprising, and it's the one that we just read. The death penalty is prescribed in the situations in which a, in some parents have a son that uh, really just will not mind, will not do what they're told, will not obey, and they are told, uh, and this is in Deuteronomy 21, if someone has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey, then his father and mother shall take hold of him, and I imagine take hold of him by the ear, and pull him along, and bring him to the elders of the town at the gate where all judgments are made. And they shall say, this son of ours, he's stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And then all the men of the town shall stone him to death. Okay? That's the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to, what did you just say, Andy? Like, seriously, that's in scripture. Yes, yes it is. And, and there is some dark humor about this. I'm sure that every mother has at some point looked at a child and said, I brought you into this world. I can take you out of it, right? My mom's favorite permutation was, go get me a branch so I can beat you with it. Uh, I never did get her a branch, but she had a paddle with my name and carved into it. It was about that long. And, she didn't need a branch. She was already well equipped, so to speak. So what do we do with this? Like, how do we make sense of this? And, and let, let's try this way. The story of Scripture is the story of how God reveals God's self to God's people. And God doesn't change, but, God's, but the people's understanding of God grows. Just like growing up, your understanding of who your parents are grow. And so at the beginning of Scripture, we have a certain approach to violence. That is how culture works. And if you look at it, it's things like Lamech. Early in Genesis, he says, uh, 70 times 7, I will be revenged. Like, if you hurt me, if you cut me, I will kill you and your wife, and I will kill your family. Like, an unrestrained vengeance type of situation. You hurt me, I will do everything in my power to kill you and kill your family. And so in this earliest part of scripture, what we're seeing is God begins by restraining violence. Like when we get to the, it's called the lex talionis, the law of the claw, the law of the tooth. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, right? That is not an argument that we find in scripture to say, if someone hurts you, you get to hurt them as much as they hurt you. It's not like, make sure you hurt them as much as they hurt you. The argument is, if someone hurts you, you can only hurt them as much as they hurt you. Right? It is not saying you get to, it's trying to reel people back in. Like, you hurt me, and you don't get to hurt the other person back again and again and again and again. It's, you can't hurt people more than they, they hurt you. And so at the beginning of Scripture, there's this action to, to restrain and pull back violence. And if it's for, like, war, it's... Um, you can go to war, but you got to go to the, the church first. You got to go talk to God, put it before God. If you're gonna, you can go to war, but you can't learn to depend upon your military to keep you safe. You can go to war, but don't take your whole army with you. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a restraining upon the uh, dependence upon war as a means of getting your way. It's a restraining violence that occurs. It's the same thing with the death penalty. And I think this is how we understand this passage we just read. Like, it is not saying uh, that the death penalty is good. It is saying that if you are going to go down that path where you think that you're going to use the death penalty, it's got to be restrained so that you got to have a good reason for it. It's got murder, idolatry, something like that. And even in the case where you are just so fried with your kids, and what parent at some point hasn't said, I'm done with them, right? I'm done, right? Uh, Maybe you are better parents than I am. Um, but you, ha you can't go and kill a child without going to the community and explaining yourself. I mean, that's kind of the sad thing about this. Like, it's not authorizing you to kill your children. It's saying that it was such a concern in that time that you had to go explain yourself to the community so that the community, the, the judges in the gate, could look at you and say, yeah, I know he's ornery, but really? 
Right? It's trying to pull violence back. And then from there, we get into the prophets who start pointing down the road and saying there's a better way. We are, the swords will be beaten to plowshares. We are, the Prince of Peace is coming. And then, then Jesus shows up and talks about loving your neighbor, even when your neighbor is really hard to get along with. And, and points down the road. And then we, we get moments like Saul, who, who turns into Paul, and, and he, he turns his life around, away from violence and towards serving Jesus. And, and um, until the, we have the beginning of the church, Church, which is the church is an embassy of the kingdom of God, where the kingdom of God is where violence has been forsaken, and, and so the church is the place where we begin to practice a peaceable way of life. And, and so that's kind of the arc of, of Scripture when it comes to violence. It's not that back in the Old Testament God was violent and angry, it's that in the Old Testament God was pulling back violence as the first step towards getting to the Prince of Peace. And, and so if nothing else, when we start talking about the death penalty, I I, I hope we can all agree that we we don't want to stay right here. Like, let, let's not look at the Old Testament and say, well, the death penalty is in the Old Testament, and so we should use it. Uh, well, there's a lot of things in the Old Testament, and, and let's not get hung up on where God begins with God's people. Let, let's follow and head towards Jesus, right? That, that's, I think that's the way to read Scripture, head towards Jesus. So, that's what we have in the Old Testament. We get to uh, today, let's look at today. How, how do we understand the use of the death penalty today? And first, I want to have a concern based upon the power of sin to impact how we know things. And then I want to talk a bit about um, following Jesus towards peace. The death penalty in America was reinstated in 1976 by action of the Supreme Court. And the best I can tell, we're not very good at using it. There have been 1,470 executions since then. There have been 160 exonerations. 160 times where people were given the death penalty and we get, went back and said, whoa, 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 right? We were wrong. And remember, all the people who were, who were killed, like, we don't go back and check whether we get, got that right. So if you look at it state by state, Missouri uh, is, has done the fifth most executions. I think it's like 88. Um, and looking, so looking at those executions, if you look across in the, in the national study, the Government Accountability Office in 1990 found that, and I quote, the single most reliable predictor of whether someone will be sentenced to death is the race of the victim. Right, so here's how that works. If the victim, the death penalty is used when aggravated first degree murder. Dan, feel free to raise your hand and correct me at any point at, as I say this. <laughs> It's good to have a judge in the room. Um, so that, that is what is given for. Uh, and there's some treason, there's some other, but it's most often first degree aggravated murder. And if the victim is a white male, the person who is convicted is seven times more likely to get uh, the death penalty. If the victim is a white female, the person who commits the murder is 14 times more likely to get the death penalty. I find that problematic. In 1995, Sorensen and Wallace, two professors out of UNC, studied Missouri. You know, we've done so many executions, there's a good data set to work with. And what they found was, the situation where aggravated first-degree murder was for most likely to be charged, which then leads to the death penalty, was with black defendants and white victims. And uh, has anyone here done the tour of the prison they shut down in Jeff City? If you have, go down there. It's an interesting and if somewhat creepy tour. And uh, my wife and I were doing this tour before kids, and we got to the, bring you to the chamber in which executions were done in the state of Missouri until they shut down that prison. And we looked at the wall. They had a picture of every single person who had been executed in that room. And my wife and I both had the same reaction. That sure is a lot of black people. And it was predominantly black folk. And uh, national studies in 2006 and 2014 confirmed this. Controlling for all other factors, black people are more likely to be given the death penalty. And so there's that. There is, uh, in 2015, the FBI publicly admitted that when, for 20 years, from 1980 to 2000, 
they had been asked to give hair sample analysis and in cases, in federal cases, where they, they, you know, it's very CSI, where you, there's hair found at the scene of the crime, and they take a piece of your hair, and they, the FBI will say, yes, it's a match, he, he done it. And from 1980 to 2000, they admitted they had been overstating the reliability of those tests significantly. And that 95% of the time, that they had erred on towards the prosecution and that then of those situations 32 of those 268 cases impacted were death penalty cases right now i can tell you more but i think you start to see the trend here you can look for individual cases and you'll find them like there's a case in south dakota this is in newsweek that points out that a jury told the press after the fact that after a, a man had been given the death penalty that the logic for why they had given the death penalty was they found out the man who had been convicted was gay and they didn't want him to potentially enjoy life in an all-male prison like so he should die because we don't want him to enjoy himself which I, I just find that logic problematic. I think it would be wise for us to admit two things. First, our lives have been impacted by sin such that we all have the capability to be utterly certain and completely wrong. Like how many times are we utterly certain of something and then we are wrong, right? How many times a week am I? <laughs> Second, I think I, I would argue that uh, the government is not perfect. Anyone here want to argue with me on that? <laughs> no, right? The government is not perfect. And when the government takes this action based upon the actions of a jury full of people who are completely capable of being con utterly convinced and wrong, the nature of sin, it impacts how we are able to know, how much we are know, and the certainty with which we know it. I think it would be wiser to plan to be, to be imperfect than to plan to be perfect. Because if we plan to be perfect, then we can use the death penalty all day long. But if we're going to be imperfect and know it, we might want to plan to be able to fix our mistakes. Because once you put someone to death, that's it. Right, there's no fixing that. Further, the death penalty costs a lot. Fox News came out with a study on this. In uh, June 22nd, 2015, they pointed out that every time the state says the word death penalty, it costs a million dollars. Because now you have a million dollars more in trial costs. 88, tri 88 executions in Missouri, like that's $88 million of our tax money spent on this, right? New Jersey, they have spent uh, $253 million on uh, death penalty cases since they were begun, back in the middle part of the century again. And of that $253 million, they have convicted 60 people and 50 of them were overturned. That's a lot of waste, right? The death penalty, just, it just costs a lot. It's just far easier to say we might be wrong, lock them up for life, we'll save the state a lot of money. Now, aside from that, the sort of the negative argument that as sinful people, we need to acknowledge that we are limited in what we can know, I think there is a higher calling as well. We follow Jesus. Like, the very first sermon I gave here, Jesus is Lord. That's our gig. That's our politics. That's our statement of faith. That's what we base our lives on. If Jesus isn't Lord, I mean, everyone should just sleep in on Sunday. But Jesus is Lord. So we're here. And we follow him who f believes, who came, that all, that all might be saved, all might be forgiven, and offers that forgiveness from the cross upon which he had received the judgment right, of a death penalty. We look at scripture and we see that God does not give up on people. Like we see Paul. Like Paul, the first time we, we see Paul in scripture, he is holding coats for people who are stoning Stephen, the first martyr of the Christian faith. And then he, he gets warrants. Like he, he gets the ability to go to other places and arrest Christians and have them stoned. And along the way, Jesus like is... <laughs> Why are you persecuting me? And, and the guy who had, who had been facilitating the murder of Christians becomes the guy who, who writes half of the New Testament. 
Right? God doesn't look at him and say, that's it, he's done. God looks at him and says, he can do better, let me ask and see what happens. But whenever we see a person, no matter how tarnished it is, we see someone who bears the image of God. And to say that someone has committed a horrible crime, yes, that has consequences. And yes, prison is the way that we enforce those consequences. As Christians, we understand those consequences in a certain way, though. When it comes to the consequences of the reason that we have prison, it is my understanding that we have prison for four reasons. Retribution, you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you back. Deterrence, don't do it or else you'll end up in prison. Incapacitation, I'd rather you not keep on hurting people. And rehabilitation, we really would like you to get better and be able to go join society again. As Christians, we are called to focus on certain of those and deny others. We are called to turn the other cheek, no matter how deep the wound is. And so I do not believe that we should use prison as a way to exact retribution. All right, it's just not Christian. That person hurt me, so we need to hurt them back. That isn't Christian logic. I do think we can say, and I, I definitely think we should say, incapacitation. All right, if you hurt somebody and you're going to try to hurt someone again, we should stop you, right? Both of my grandfathers were police officers. <laughs> I believe in this. If you are going to harm your neighbors, you should be stopped. And if you're going to keep on doing it, we should stop you until you are not going to hurt others, right? That's incapacitation and then rehabilitation, right? We believe that God's never done with anyone, and we just don't know who. Like, we don't know. There are people who, will, for the, who are so stubbornly committed to sin that they will spend the rest of their lives trying to hurt other people. That's horrible and sad to say. And they should be locked up never to see daylight again. And I'm sad about that. But that's what it is. And there are people who can turn their lives around. And that's the rehabilitation part. We don't know who, which is which. And so we need to hold out because we never know what God's going to do. And you may have noticed I completely skipped the whole deterrence thing. I don't have enough data or understanding to understand how deterrence works. Like, do people think that they shouldn't do something because they'll get caught and go to prison? Like, I'm just not wise enough to have an opinion about that. So please tell me. I, I need to know. But we look at Scripture and we see that it is profoundly true that God's never done with anyone. And if you ever need the, the most extreme example of that, look at the cross. Because Jesus is not crucified alone. There are two, one per, there's a person on either side of him, and one person starts giving him flack, and the other person says, chill, Jesus, can I be with you in heaven today? And, and there's a saying about those two thieves that is attributed to St. Augustine, though we're not actually certain if he said it, but it's on the front of your bulletin. Do not despair. One of the thieves was saved. Do not presume one of the thieves was damned. We need never despair of any one person's life because, you know, like, the thief on the cross who looked at Jesus, society was done with him, washed its hands of them, nailed him to a cross, and walked away for him to die. If you wanted to bet on the one person who was damned, that, that guy is out. That guy is going to burn. That guy, you know, and on the cross, he looks at Jesus and turns his life and says, remember me when you are in heaven. Right? Never despair. One of the thieves was saved. But do not presume that one of the thieves was damned. And that's the line that always gets me. Is it, are we uh, assuming that the other one was damned? Or, or like, what are we presuming there? I mean, it teases my mind. I, I, it, and I think that's the point of it. This matters to us in that it becomes for me the final argument that as Christians I believe we should give up on the death penalty. I don't think we will ever be able to know with enough certainty to use it, to use it well, to use it wisely. And I think as people who follow Jesus, that we are called to a better way, a way of peace that acknowledges that Jesus doesn't judge anyone until the end, 
Neither should we. There should always be consequences for actions, and some people will be should and will be incapacitated for the rest of their lives, yet we never know amongst that population who should turn, who will turn. Now, why does that matter to us today? Like, I don't think anyone here has been involved in any death penalty cases. Any serious, anyone? Okay, I don't think, and I hope none of us ever are. But what I do think we can say is that this particular approach to disagreement in restraining violence does apply to our lives. Because we do end up disagreeing with each other. We have grudges, we have falling outs. And what I do think we can say is that if Jesus was willing to forgive even those who had been handed down the death penalty against him, as people who follow him, we are called to practice forgiveness in the same way. Not to forget and gloss over when we've been wrong, like turning the other cheek, turning the other cheek, turning the other cheek, eventually, duck, right? At what point do you stop getting hurt and you just walk away? It does happen. And I'm not saying anyone should ever run towards being hurt, but keeping the door open so that the one who hurts us might one day be able to walk back in and say, I was wrong, can you forgive me? And to give people graceful ways to come out of sin and not like lock them into, they're always the person who hurt me. There are people who have hurt me and I would welcome them to this table and it would not be easy. But I follow Jesus, and he died for all. And I don't know if God's done with certain people. I hope he's not. Amen. I invite you to stand with me, and let's confess our faith together using the words of the apostles.